I now look to Peter Dawson to continue the case for the opposition. Well, good evening. Um, I'd like to begin with some very good news, um, and good news for one of my opponents. Um, I think you can be certain, Sarah, that um, prawns are very rarely harmed in the making of prawn crackers. <laughs> um, has, has anyone ever watched Porridge? Yes, you see, I, I, was so, I was so relieved when I saw the sponsors for this evening, I thought there will be at least a few people in the room who know what I'm talking about. Um, in, in olden times, when, when people watched television programmes on things called televisions, um, and there were only three channels to choose from, there was a programme called Porridge, which gave a portrayal of life in a typical British prison. It was a comedy. And every episode opened with the stentorian tones of a judge, punctuated by the uh, clanking of gates and the rattling of keys, with these words. Norman Stanley Fletcher, you are an habitual criminal who accepts arrest as an occupational hazard and presumably accepts imprisonment in the same casual manner. And every episode would go on to portray this prison as a largely good-humoured, uh, almost entirely non-violent, gentle war of attrition between prisoners and the screws, the staff. It was genuinely funny, wholesome family viewing. Um, and it's become something of a cliché in prison circles that porridge remains the most accurate portrayal of prison life. Um, well, of course it isn't. The real prison system is in desperate crisis. But staff and prisoners still cooperate for much of their time to make the experience of imprisonment bearable for both. Good prisons aspire to relationships that are meaningful and demonstrate kindness. Very admirably, the prison service in this country, every couple of years, in every prison, surveys prisoners to ask them if they are treated with kindness. I enjoyed most of the time I spent working in prison, and that would have been impossible if there was not kindness in the prison. There were also certainly very many Norman Stanley Fletchers in prison, and I knew one in the prison that I ran for six years called Highdown. Um, I'll call him Norman for the um, sake of continuity. Well, my Norman was a serial complainer. When I arrived, the, uh, the bottom drawer of the governor's desk was full of written complaints from Norman. He knew far more about prison rules uh, than I did. He knew far more about how prisons ran than anybody in the prison. Uh, and he was jolly entertaining company. Uh, and the reason that he knew all this was that he had spent most of his life in prison and he was in his 60s. It seemed fine, actually. We had lots of pleasant conversations. But actually, Norman was old and was very ill. He was dying a slow death in prison. And as he was dying this slow death, he received a letter that told him he had a daughter that he had never known. She'd written to him. And he faced the dilemma of whether to give her a visiting order, which is the slip that allows people to visit you in prison, so that she could come to a visits hall with hundreds of people in it, uh, other prisoners, their visitors, staff, and have his first meeting with the daughter he didn't know he had in that environment. And I can tell you that all of a sudden, the senseless waste of his life spent in custody was all too apparent. Prison is pain. Humans are astonishingly resilient, but the pains of imprisonment are multifaceted, they run deep, and they endure far beyond the point of release. We have quite wrongly, in my view, come to accept that for some there will be no release, with people sentenced to end their life in prison. Others cannot endure it, and they take their own life. Well over 300 people a year are effectively receiving a death sentence more than 50 years after the death penalty in this country was abolished. The pains of imprisonment include shame, anger, remorse and regret. They include loneliness, frustration and despair. They infect the families and loved ones of the incarcerated. They may be mitigated, and I hope in many of our prisons most people still seek to mitigate those pains. They can certainly be exacerbated, and Francis has described prisons 
which exacerbate those pains to a terrifying degree. But in my view, they cannot be prevented. We choose to inflict a mountain of pain in the name of justice. So when, like me, you have given three decades of, of your life, your whole career, to being part of the system that carries out that deliberate infliction of pain, the question of what justifies it is very far from academic. It's essential to be clear what the reason for doing this dreadful thing is. Well, I think the answer lies in the human condition. I looked up retribution. I got a definition of punishment inflicted as vengeance. We are talking about revenge. So I looked up vengeance and got some very unhelpful quotations which told me how noble it was to forswear vengeance and that this issue this indicated greater strength and a higher moral quality altogether. So I went to the person who really understands human nature, someone called Bill Shakespeare, and this is what I found. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Well, that, of course, is Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, both sinned against and sinner, and in, that's in common with all of us. The desire for revenge in response to a harm suffered cannot be wished away. It may not be universal, and it may well be exaggerated in the media and in fiction of one kind or another, but it is real and pervasive, and any society must deal with the dilemma that that presents. So what are the consequences of not regulating the business of retribution? Well, most obviously, anarchy and excess look at the aftermath of victory in battle or war. But less dramatically, consider the consequences of a response to harm that depends on the attitude of the victim rather than the harm done. It cannot make sense for the person who assaults a naturally forgiving victim to be treated differently to the person whose victim has less admirable instincts. Can I really say that I would respond to a serious attack on someone I loved by seeking only reconciliation and a desire to avoid a repetition? I think not. So taking retribution into the care of the state is the least worst option. It is a necessary evil. But when the harm done is severe, the deprivation of liberty through imprisonment is the least worst mechanism for a regulated response. <coughs> Alternative purposes for imprisonment exist, not least in statute, but they're not justifications. Um, deterrence, deterrence doesn't work, Francis is quite right. Uh, deterrence requires foresight, and most of the people in prison don't benefit from foresight. Rehabilitation is a more interesting suggested justification for imprisonment, and of course it's the proper goal for everyone who works in prison. It's hard to believe that people can seriously do that job without wanting to make a positive difference in the life of the people that they care for. But we know that rehabilitation works better in the community than in prison, and we know why. Imprisonment invariably makes it harder to live a crime-free life, and the widespread prejudice against former prisoners, given substance in everything from job applications to getting insurance, ensures that that disadvantage endures well beyond release. We should never send someone to prison because we think it will do them good. Protecting the public is also urged upon us as a powerful reason to incarcerate. But I have to tell you that where slippery slopes are concerned, this is positively the black run. The shameful history of the discredited IPP sentence has demonstrated that. Many thousands of people are currently in prison only because of a fear of what they might do in the future rather than as punishment, retribution. We have exaggerated our powers of prediction and allowed a narrative that portrays a second serious offence as something from which the public has an absolute right to be protected. And the consequence is indefinite detention on a once unimagin unimaginable scale. So we are left with retribution as the only legitimate justification for the harm that we do. Retributive justice is very far from obsolete. But it carries with it the weightiest possible responsibilities as the state assumes absolute control over the well-being of 83,000 of its citizens. Those responsibilities must include a proportionate response to harm. We must show restraint and feel regret at the infliction of pain. We have lost that restraint and are regularly sending young people to prison for longer than they have been alive. Justice is not justice without mercy. It requires a system that is just and fair in its operation, from trial all the way through to release and beyond. But injustice is rampant 
in many parts of our system, <coughs> and discrimination on the grounds of race and gender in particular is endemic. And those enduring punishment must enjoy comprehensive and effective protections against an overmighty state and its agents, agents like me. But they currently do not. We do not even have a statutory code of standards for the treatment of prisoners. I never went to work as a governor with the intention to inflict misery, quite the reverse. But I hope I never lost sight of the actual unavoidable impact of imprisonment on the lives of those living through it. The justification for what I have done has been to make safe and survivable the business of revenge. I beg to oppose the motion. <laughs>